The following is a reading of A World in Captivity. Author David C. Pack. This booklet is provided free of charge and in the public interest by the Restored Church of God. Copyright 2017, The Restored Church of God, All Rights Reserved, printed in the USA. Introduction, progress in science and technology has never been greater. Advances in knowledge have brought awesome progress, while immortality and human degeneration have never been worse. Why? An unseen kidnapper holds humanity hostage and has convinced his captives that he is a benefactor. Yet, events of staggering magnitude will soon shock the world, changing everything. Happiness, abundance, world peace, and deliverance lie just ahead. Chapter 1 The world has reached the 21st century. All my grandparents were born in the 19th century, within that time span just a little over a hundred years. The world has changed beyond recognition. Mankind now stands on the threshold of annihilation by weapons of mass destruction with the frightening specter of terrorism spanning the globe. World conditions grow more ominous as the news of each day seems worse than the last. Events are speeding toward a great crisis at the close of this age. How do there come to be such appalling evils and terrible suffering on a worldwide scale? Why have world leaders failed to improve the countries they govern and the world at large? What is wrong? Why has progress in knowledge, science, and technology not delivered man from his problems? Why does civilization stand on the brink of catastrophe, even extinction, without some kind of intervention and rescue? Many know something is wrong, but do not know what. The supposed experts lack answers to life's great questions. Few understand that there is a supreme purpose that God is working out here below. Fewer still know what this purpose is. They do not understand the forces at work that have controlled civilization since man first appeared on earth. The Greatest Kidnapping Most assume that things are the way they are because mankind has evolved to its present state or condition. This thinking permeates modern education. But it is false, or at best, partial truth. An entirely wrong premise. Darwinian evolution is a fiction created by men who have been led to this theory by the one who seeks to blind all the inhabitants of the earth to God's awesome plan. The staggering purpose for mankind. Note, there are theological positions that embrace evolutionary processes, but yet discount the fallacy of Darwinian evolution in its 
partial view of reality. Continuing, those who hold to the evolutionary theory, this is speaking of Darwinism specifically, are prevented, actually blocked, from comprehending why conditions on earth are as they are. Many statesmen, leaders, and thinkers do feel trapped by these conditions and the general flow of world events and unable to do anything about them. Indeed, they are trapped, but we need to understand why. This, this current evil age, is not God's world. It is cut off from him and held hostage by an unseen super kidnapper. All of humanity has been deceived into believing the soothing words of this great captor, thinking themselves better off under his care and leadership. I speak of Satan the devil and his hijacking. Six thousand years ago of Adam and Eve and all the inhabitants of the planet Earth ever after. But the world has remained a willing captive ever since. Anyone who reads newspapers understands kidnapping. This crime often involves executives of large companies whose release is obtained through paying a ransom. Hijackers work in the same way, except that this crime usually involves seizing an aircraft, bus, or some other type of vehicle full of victims. Most hostages are captives until someone either performs a daring rescue or a ransom is paid. Earth is now in a state of captivity requiring supernatural deliverance, rescue, through ransom payment. Here is modern man's predicament. Imagine picking up a 20 chapter book and trying to understand it by starting with the last chapter. You would be lost, completely unable to understand the meaning of persons and events described. In the same way, none can understand events in the modern world because they do not have proper background of what has happened in the previous chapters of mankind's existence on earth. And it is the very chapter of the story of humanity that is key to all 19 chapters that follow. Whose world is this? May have supposed that the governments of modern nations reflect God's way. This is almost everyone's assumption, actually. Why, while we will learn that God does, in fact, establish and remove nations. We will also learn that this is not God's world. This is why Christ foretold the coming of God's world, world ruling supergovernment to replace the confused, ineffective, inefficient governments of man. These governments are powerless to solve any of the world's biggest problems. Added note, they seem to be stuck in an unending cycle of repetitive cataclysm. Continuing, how did the world come to be the way that it is? Why is it in such a state of confusion, suffering, and ignorance? Why can't governments get along, avoid war, find peace, reach agreement? Why such constant instability, scandal, and division among leaders and seemingly endless revolutions and military coups? Why is there no shortage of demagogues, dictators, and revolutionaries who always promise to make things better, 
yet are only able to preside over a continual worsening of problems and conditions. Despite these conditions, most theologians, religionists, and ministers blindly assume that this is God's world, that it reflects his guidance, his way. Therefore, they conclude that if all Christians would work together in love and unity to make this world and its governments a safer and better place for all, it could bring peace, happiness, and prosperity to the world. This is a completely wrong view. Nowhere did Christ say, Go into all the world and strive to make it a better place by becoming part of it. He often said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Christ did not come to make this world a better place. He came to announce the coming of a better world under his government or kingdom. In short, blind, deceived men think that they can bring world peace through human effort alone. Ironically, this quest often involves Christian nations striving to achieve peace through war. They see certain evil forces at work and feel compelled to do something about it. They assume that Christ would be an activist seeking to make the world a better place. Be honest. Haven't you heard this many times? Haven't you heard churches urge people to get involved or take a stand or something similar in order to improve some local, national, or world problem? Who holds sway over earth? Satan the devil is called the god of this world. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4. The Prince of this world. John 12.31 14.30 And the Prince of the Power of the Air. Ephesians 2.2 2. The Apostle John wrote that he quote, deceives the whole world. Unquote. Revelation 12, 9. Satan rebelled against God's government prior to the recreation of earth. Genesis 1, 1 and 3. This is perhaps a reference to a world age that existed before this earth age. Continuing, he had led one-third of all angels into rebellion. 2 Peter 2.4, Revelation 12.4. Isaiah 14, 12-14 reveals that he had ruled the earth, and Ezekiel 28.15 shows that he was a created being, a great and perfect archangel. He remains as ruler over earth until he is removed after Christ's return. Christ qualified to replace him at his first coming. So, Satan was lying in wait for baby Adam and Eve. They were created on the sixth day of the week, rested on the Sabbath, and were seduced by Satan. Revela or Genesis 3, 1 through 6. The next day, at the age of two days old, no two-day-old child knows how to discern right from wrong. Adam and Eve just thought they were grown up enough to make their own decisions. Like most children today, they chose not to listen to their parent, this being God, and this is simply an analogy, 
Instead, they believed Satan's lie, and they would not surely die. In so doing, they rejected the rule of God's government in their lives. <clears throat> if Adam had obeyed God's instruction, he could have qualified to replace Satan and restore the government of God on earth. He chose captivity instead. Now read this account. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. He said unto the woman, Yes, as God said, You shall not eat of the tree, or every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die, for God does know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her. And he did eat, and the eyes of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And he sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. Now this account can be read literally, mythically, esoterically, allegorically, and symbolically as well. To get into the deeper symbolisms of this story, mind you, this particular and a literal reading is the rated G version. These metaphors and symbols are speaking of truths that one perhaps needs to investigate further. A simple historical literal reading will not suffice. One must go further in, which is a definition of esoteric as in esoteric Christianity and its interpretations as well. Continuing, in this historic account, Satan lied to Eve, who led Adam into sin with her. The devil's deceit captured these two adult children into the belief that they no longer needed to listen to God, their parent. <clears throat> Being thrust from the garden, they were forced to fend for themselves. They rejected God's perfect law and rule, His government over all creation, as guides in their lives, and were made captive to Satan and His way of sin. Because of sin, they no longer had access to God's blessings, guidance, protection, or the gift of His Holy Spirit, which would have come by eating the tree of life. The tree of life later came to symbolize Christ. As the story progresses throughout the scripture, into the New Testament. And all its associated symbolisms. <clears throat> the 7,000 year plan. Cut off from God by sin. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. Mankind has believed the lies of the God of this world for 6,000 years. The 
core of God's plan encompasses 7,000 years. Few have understood this. Many have correctly understood at least some of the verses describing Christ's coming 1,000 year reign, but they know nothing of God's allotting 6,000 years, or six millennial days of a seven day week to Satan's rule under Satan prior to the 7,000 year day. We are near the end of the sixth day, metaphorically speaking. We must understand, the Bible says, But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Second Peter 3 8, Psalm 90, verse 4. Of course, most are ignorant of almost everything that the Bible teaches, Will you comprehend? Man under the invisible sway of Satan has been given six days or six thousand years to try his own ways, governments, religions, philosophies, value systems, and forms of education. Under the influence of Satan, he has practiced sin and disobedience to God's commands for nearly 6,000 years. He has even tried to treat all of ill effects instead of the cause, which is breaking God's commandments. God is allowing man to learn painful, bitter lessons. The masses who have never known the precious truth of God must learn that their own ways do not work. How it all started. John wrote, In the beginning was the Word. John 1 1. And then continued, The Word was with God, and the Word was God. If there is one who was God, or who was also with God, it is obvious that two functional beings, two persons, are described. Verse 14 continues, The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, the only God being whoever became flesh in order to dwell among men is Jesus Christ. Remember, it says that the Word was made flesh. Christ was not flesh until He came to earth to become the Savior of mankind, to pay the ransom, His life, and eventually deliver mankind from captivity. Genesis 1-1 states, In the beginning, God. Moses recorded the first five books of the Old Testament in the Hebrew language. The Hebrew word translated God is Elohim, a uni-plural word like team, group, family, or church. And I would add that this Elohim consists of both divine masculine and feminine aspects. Continuing, God is one family, one God composed of two aspects or beings. This is why Christ could be God and be with God at the same time. John 4.24 states that God is a spirit. God is made up or composed of spirit. Men are composed of flesh. God and Christ enjoy perfect harmony and agreement in everything they do. They reflect perfect outgoing concern, love, and cooperation. The Father is the supreme leader of a family that both 
clo or chose to expand. First, God created the angels and then the entire physical universe, including Earth. Then, later in Genesis 1, we find that God said, Let us, more than one, perhaps an innumerable company, make man in our image, after our likeness. Verse 26. There was clearly more than one personages involved in the creation of man. Verse 25 shows that each animal was made after his kind. Dogs come from dogs and puppies that look like dogs. Cats come from cats and have kittens that look like cats. Horses come from horses and have foals that look like horses. These, or this, is true throughout the entire animal kingdom. This is no mystery. But here is what has been a mystery. Men are not part of the animal kind. They are not, they do not carry the likeness of any beast of the earth. Verse 25. They are made in the image and likeness of God. They are part of the God kind. So says the Bible. Genesis 2 7 states, God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, or spirit, and man became a living soul. Man is made out of physical matter, flesh, while he is not composed of what God is composed of, spirit. Man is formed in the image and likeness of God. It is that imparted spirit that creates the image and the likeness, or life. Also, take note that this verse says, Man became, not had, a soul. People do not have souls, they are souls. Throughout the Bible are references to God's body parts. They show that God has eyes, ears, hands, feet, a mouth, nostrils, arms, and legs, etc. In just one location, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, mentions his face, ears, and hands. Numerous verses make references to the mind of God and Christ, Philippians 2, 5. Humans have all of these same physical attributes that God himself possesses, although made of flesh and not spirit. At this point, I would argue that this is partially true. Man simply living out of his fleshly life or body or material materialistic philosophies, for example, and not spirit, but I would add that there are indeed human beings that have the impartation of God's Holy Spirit with the born-again experience. This is perhaps speaking of simply the natural man. Continuing, human beings have been given hands so that they can create paws, claws, and hooves are not capable of building complex televisions. If a mind is directing them, and of course animals have brains, not necessarily minds as compared to the consciousness of man. Animals function on instinct primarily. Almost immediately after birth, they know exactly how to function, how to stand up, take steps, and find where to get milk. Babies require far longer to even stand up and have to be taught how to do everything. 
Human beings are capable of acquiring knowledge. Animals do not have this capability. God has programmed into animals through instinct everything that they need to function effectively within their environment. I would add this condition perhaps will change as in the visions and, and symbols within the context of the biblical narrative of the new heaven and earth where the nature of wild beasts are even changed and transformed under the conditions of the new heaven and earth but this is speaking of the differences between the animal kingdom and the human kingdom and not necessarily equating them as does many evolutionary theories continuing Human beings do not instinctively know everything that they need to know in order to operate successfully throughout their lives. As they grow older and more demands are made upon them, they must acquire ever more knowledge. All knowledge that men obtain falls into two categories. First is the knowledge of how to work with matter and physical things. Second is the kind of knowledge necessary to develop a personal relationship with both God and their fellow man. All knowledge, therefore, is either physical or spiritual knowledge. I would add here that it doesn't necessarily require that it be either or. One must have both. Physical knowledge is required through the five senses, sight, hearing, smell, touch, and taste. Might I add the connection between supernature and extrasensory perception? Continuing, people understand that they must acquire a certain amount of useful knowledge and keep adding to it throughout their lives. They recognize that they must learn to eat, learn to ride a bike, learn to play a piano, hammer a nail, cut the grass, read a book, get dressed, drive a car, master one or more skills en route to a career, and many other things. Animals are not like this to function as adults requires much physical knowledge of course this is not hard to understand most adults recognize that no one can succeed in life without a certain amount of knowledge today people need more knowledge than ever to survive in an ever more complex world but there is a big problem in all of this the physical knowledge that we have described has not been sufficient or of the right kind for mankind to be able to solve the complex problems afflicting all the nations of the world. For instance, he is utterly incapable of achieving world peace. Why? What knowledge. We must now examine what no one understands. Remember, man is made of flesh, but he has another non-physical, critically important component that must be explained. The Apostle Paul wrote, quote, for what man knows the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knows no man but the spirit of God. 1 Corinthians 2.11 So, no man knows the things of God but the spirit of God which is in 
indwelling those who are believers. And what causes one to have faith? Faith is an impartation and a gift from God. And that is how one can know Do not try to interpret this verse. Let it interpret itself. Accept it for what it says. This verse identifies two different kinds of spirit. The spirit of God and the spirit of man. They are not the same. Each provides a different functioning in acquiring knowledge. Human knowledge, the things of a man, is acquired because... God has given man a human spirit, the spirit in man. Which I would argue that without this, man is simply dead matter. James, the apostle, uh, proclaimed in his epistle that the body without the spirit is dead. Hence the concept of being physically alive but spiritually dead or asleep so to speak. So the metaphor of awakening or rising from one's grave is akin to awakening to the Spirit of God. Each provides a different function in acquiring knowledge. Human knowledge, the things of a man, is acquired because God has given men a human spirit. Paul's inspired statement also makes clear that spiritual knowledge, or the things of God, can only be acquired by the presence of the Spirit of God. If this is lacking, then obviously the things of God are considered by the natural person or man to be foolish. Even this very knowledge is in itself truly amazing. Think of it this way. Virtually no one has the knowledge about how either physical or spiritual knowledge is acquired. It is the false doctrine of Darwinian evolution that holds scientists and educators as captives completely unable to understand the knowledge described here. In fact, within our public educational system, this knowledge is repelled, obstructed, rejected, outright. The book of Job plainly states, but there is a spirit in man, and the inspiration of the Almighty gives them understanding. Job 32.8. This confirms what Paul said. This identifies that there is a spirit in man. While recognizing spiritual understanding or knowledge comes from God. <clears throat> Animals do not have the spirit in man. Animal brains are entirely different from human minds, consciously speaking. Human, humans are given the spirit of man from conception. It also allows them, through use of the five senses, to acquire and retain knowledge, natural knowledge. Without this unseen spirit element, man would be just another dumb beast. 
but I would argue that the animal kingdom is not as well understood as many claim. And I wouldn't call them dumb beasts, personally speaking. Animals are highly intelligent beings. Perhaps their domestication is a part of their inquire, acquiring a relationship with the human kingdom. And that, in a sense, lifts them up into a relational aspect. They're far more intelligent than humans have given them credit. But this is an analogy. I would say, but he is made in the image of God and has been given the power to acquire, retain, and use knowledge for all kinds of purposes. All human beings were created by God to receive two completely different spirits. One comes at conception and the other comes by an entirely different means. Without the Spirit of God, people are literally not all there. Their existence remains limited to what they can acquire on their own without God's help. Spirit gives birth to spirit, and flesh gives birth to flesh. Marvel not when I say you must be born again. Earlier, we left off talking about the tree of life, a symbol of Christ, or the cross. Let's now return to it, remembering that Adam was offered the opportunity to eat of this tree. And eating the fruit of a tree is a metaphor for a higher reality. That is something that you perhaps should look further into beyond the literal reading of the mythic story of Genesis. Delivered from the penalty of death, man is not naturally headed toward eternal life. He is headed toward death. Human beings live approximately 70 to 80 years, and in some parts of the world much less. Some human beings are gifted with longer lives, and they perhaps live 120 years or more. Consult the Genesis book of world records for the longest age lived in our present age, or eon. A few manage to live longer, but all eventually die. That is the bodily death. Yet, this was never God's original purpose. God wants everyone to experience life for all eternity. But as the narrative goes, somewhere something went wrong. Those who are familiar with the Bible know exactly what went wrong. God intends that all human beings ultimately receive the, His Spirit. He wants it to eventually enter all minds. Let's learn what role this second Spirit component plays. That is the Spirit of or life that's imparted to man from God, and how it works with the spirit in man. I would add that it's the same spirit but void of the knowledge of its divine purposes. Sometime after the fall, this knowledge was lost, and 
forgotten. Notice what Paul wrote. The Spirit, that is the Holy Spirit itself, bears witness with our spirit. Spirit in man, that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs, or inheritors, with Christ. Romans 8, 16 and 17. Two spirits are described here. Notice that God's spirit works with human spirit to bring human beings to salvation as joint heirs with Christ. And I would add that the obstructor, the accuser, attempts to uh, end run this process to stop it, to influence man to its ways. And that negative spirit, that spirit of Satan, the devil, is at work as well. And it is in opposition and also works with the spirit in man to influence his decisions to either accept or reject the gospel message. It is the spirit that Adam was offered and would have received had he eaten of the tree of life. In 1 Corinthians 2, Paul also said, But the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God. I would say that that which is contrary to the Spirit of God, that negative spirit or Satan or spirit of death, is influencing the natural mind of man to do things contrary to the things of the Spirit of God. But the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God. They are obstructed, for they are foolishness unto him, that is, in his own intellect and reasoning. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. In other words, in order to have faith and to have the impartation of the Holy Spirit and to have spiritual discernment and to be able to recognize the difference between what is from God and what is not that must be an impartation and gift from God we cannot strive on our own to effectually receive the gift of faith that is a gift from above, if you will. It is not by human effort that we acquire this discernment. It comes from God. So if ever there was a physical proof, believers are walking physical proof of these things, which many if, wouldn't believe if they see. And this is exactly what we witness in our world today. In order to believe in God, we must first see, they say, according to atheistic notions. This is an enormously important verse, that is, 1 Corinthians 2.14. It is not possible for human beings to understand spiritual knowledge, spiritual understanding. Such things can only seem foolish to a mind that cannot spiritually discern. There is a cutoff, and that is due to the fall or the forgetting. 
no matter how intelligent or talented a person may be, without the Spirit of God, it can be said that they have a spiritual IQ of zero. No spiritual life except for the spirit that they've been temporarily given. It also says elsewhere in scripture, the soul that sins shall die. And so, the work of Christ and the cross is a way that God has made to bridge the gap between life and death to all those that would believe upon the gospel message, the good news of the coming kingdom of peace with Christ as its head and king and Lord. None of the problems common to individuals or nations can be properly addressed and resolved without the involvement of the Spirit or the Holy Spirit at work in minds. Human intelligence alone and ingenuity are insufficient. Obviously, even attempting to tell people that they do not have the spiritual component is a useless exercise. If God is not opening their minds, see John 6:44 and 65, it will seem foolish to them because even this information is spiritually discerned. In fact, they will more than likely shut their ears and close their eyes to what's being said, perhaps even running in the opposite direction. <clears throat> that is why the work of ministry must be carefully applied and conveyed lest we lose precious souls. The more intelligent, self-reliant, and accomplished the person is, the more foolish it will probably seem to him or her to, to be told that his mind is incomplete. If Adam had eaten the tree of life, he would have received the Spirit of God. Just the existence of the tree of life in the garden is a symbol that at one point in time they had that privilege. He would have learned the way of love, the give way, instead of the get way of life practiced by this world, influenced by the God of this age. The Bible says that love is the fulfilling of the law, Romans 13.10, that the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Notice it says, in our hearts. That is not altogether of the intellect or mind. This is why things spiritually discerned are perhaps foolishness to those of a highly headstrong philosophy that are not necessarily led by their heart. Romans 5.5. 5. Romans 8.6 states, quote, For to be carnally minded, or physically, or just naturally minded, is death. 
but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And I would add here that in a non-dual consciousness, we exist as physical beings and are not only physically minded, but at the impartation of the Spirit of God, we become spiritually minded. It's not that we do not have the natural inclinations, they do not altogether completely go away. Our ego is intact, but it takes a back seat, so to speak, and we are led by the Spirit rather than that of our natural inclinations only. <clears throat> the Spirit of God and His wisdom overrides our intellect that would have been separated. If Adam had received the Spirit of God, he would have had life inherent within him. This is why Christ, being the fullness of all life, <clears throat> was called the second Adam, or the last Adam. Adam, a reference to mankind. He would have been an inheritor with Christ as much as any true believer today. He would have had also known the way to peace. This is abs absolutely remarkable understanding, unknown to all but a scattered few on earth today. It has not been understood until our time. Great confusion. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 14.33, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. In verse 40, he added, Let all things be done decently and in order. It is God's will that there be order and structure instead of disorder, chaos, peace instead of war, decency instead of indecency, and clear understanding instead of confusion. Now, we ask crucial questions. Why is this world filled with confusion? The, the definition of and the spiritual meaning of Babylon means confusion, where God confused the languages. Why is it in such a terrible state of disorder. Why is why do disorder and confusion permeate religion, education, values, morals, ethics, philosophy, politics, and government? Why have men not been able to answer life's most important questions? This world is filled with disease, war, famine, ignorance, poverty, pollution, hatred, crime, immorality, corruption, misery, and unhappiness. This is not the kingdom of God, although elements and aspects of God's kingdom are scattered it has not yet fully come. Why can world leaders not solve these problems? It is because they do not know the one who has the solutions. It is because they do not know where to find the answers. It is because Satan, the devil, is playing a far greater role than realized. These are vital questions. They require straightforward, plain truth answers. Although the answers aren't always plain,
and sometimes truth can be stranger than the fiction. You will hear us say, blow the dust off your Bible, examine it carefully, and see the real truth that has always been on its pages. But do not try to read it as though it were just some book uninspired by God. It's not a novel to be read by rational intellect alone. It must be spiritually discerned. And this is why we have in our world professional Bible teachers. The Bible must be clarified and discerned and not just read. If you do that, the spirit of doubt, I'm sure, will enter in and you will not progress in your Bible studies. Just like faith is imparted by the Spirit, so is understanding of the Scripture. Otherwise, you may think that what is written in seemingly plain black and white language is confused via the filter of your own intellect. You must prayerfully read and understand. Without that, you probably will not. So the atheistic approach to the text will not suffice. If you're reading the Bible without God's direction, you're reading it wrong, and you probably will consider it to be a useless, archaic book to be rejected, which is an apparent message coming from the world of agnosticism and atheism. It must be approached with faith, or you will not comprehend its content. You will hear us repeat, don't believe us just because we say something, but rather believe it if you see it proven in your Bible. And I would add that you won't see it unless you discern it. The plain truth is that the Bible contains the answers to those towering questions. However, none are what is commonly taught. From as early as Sunday school, most have been taught to believe ideas that everyone assumes are in the Bible, prepare to be surprised, shocked at what is really at what it really has to say about this fallen angel of whom so much is said but so little is correctly known and understood. Paul wrote, Prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. 1 Thessalonians 5.21 And prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Romans 12.2 Will you do this? We will examine the above questions and how they relate to the devil by looking at the basic important verses that describe him. Who is, who is he, what he is, and what his role is? To do this, we must leave behind the ideas of men. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And do not, and be not conformed to this world. But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may 
prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So the impartation of the Spirit renews one's mind so that one can know the will of God. And where can this will be found? Partially within the written word, the revealed revelations of the scriptures. And so on. To be continued. There are three chapters in a world in captivity. So it's a booklet. Chapter 2 will be forthcoming. Thank you for your interest.